All right. Hello, I'm Julia, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about some robot brains. So first, an uh, important question that some of you might be worried about. Robots are not going to take over the world yet. <laughs> but you might think about this more and more because there are now a lot more robots around us. They're becoming a lot more common and something that more of us are likely to see every day. So there are more and more robot toys, and those are fun, but they're not very useful. We start to get things that are more useful. You have uh, vacuum robots that are making our lives easier so we don't have to vacuum. When you get something delivered from Amazon, chances are that a robot helps package and ship that, that, that item. And also, in a way that can actually save lives, we have uh, surgical robots. And we're even starting to send robots to take over other worlds. Mars, in fact, is the only planet that's entirely inhabited by robots. But we're telling you how to make smart robots. And the reason we're worried about this is because at this point, robots aren't very smart. And we see a lot of cases. We see the state of the art in robots, where robots aren't smart. So this is a video from the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. And this was all, top universities from all over the world putting together the best robots they could with government funding. And that's what happens. <laughs> this is, of course, the failure video. They do some impressive things as well. But the problem is that things that are easy for humans, like getting out of a car, turn out to actually be incredibly difficult for robots in some cases. Or you just fall down in front of a door. So the question is, what can we do to make smarter robots? Not to take over the world, but to make robots that are better at doing things uh, that are actually going to make a positive impact in people's lives. We're going to do this in four parts. So first, we're going to start with an important question. Before you have smart robots, you have to ask, what is a robot, and what does it mean for a robot to be smart? Next, we're going to talk about the brains, and I'll cover that, talk about what makes a smart robot brain. Busa will then talk about how we make the smart robot body. And lastly, we'll talk about how those things work together to make better robots. So the first question we have here, what is a robot? How do we define a robot before we can say what makes it smart? So there are three things that a robot has to do in order for us to consider it a robot. So the first thing it has to do is it has to sense its environment. We have our senses. You all learned about the five senses in school at some point. But this can be a lot of different things. And it not, a robot doesn't have to have all five senses like a human has in order for it to sense the world in some way. But once it senses the world, it needs to do something with that. So it takes in this information. It has to make some decisions or think about something. And once it makes a decision on what to do, it has to actually act. It has to take some action in the physical world. And once it takes that action, it can sense what happens as a result of that. So we need robots to be able to s sense, decide, and act in order to be a robot. So how about some examples of what actually is a robot? The first robot actually dates all the way back to 1948. This was sort of the first device that was considered to have all three of these components. And it was called a tortoise robot, because as you can see, it looks a little like a tortoise. It had the ability to bump into things and know it had hit something. It could back up. It could decide where to move, and it could follow a light back to find its source, it could to go back home. So it was a very simple robot, obviously. But even very early on, we were thinking about more complex robots, robots more like humans, as a matter of fact. Starting in 1962, the Jetsons had a robot named Rosie. Rosie was a maid robot, but a very sassy one, I'd say. Um, but obviously, that's not the state that robots were in that era. We're getting closer to robots that we think of as being more human-like now. For example, this is the newer version of that robot you saw failing in the last video. And uh, it's actually done some impressive things like parkour, for example. But since then, our idea of what we imagine robots in fiction has also changed and also grown and expanded. So a lot of you are probably familiar with WALL-E. And WALL-E is not a human-like robot. And, but it was very mechanical in a sense in the way it looked, but we gave it, anthropomorphized it a lot and gave it a lot of attributes and thought of Wally as a really smart and clever robot. But what isn't a robot? So those things all kind of seem to you like robots. They're kind of obviously robots. But it's just as important, how do we make the distinction back on the other side of that line? So first of all, your computer isn't a robot. So why is it not a robot? If we think about those three things we talked about before, it has quite the brain, you could imagine, a very powerful processor, 
but it doesn't really have ability to sense its environment or take action. It's still stuck sitting on your desk or your phone in your pocket. So what about something that you can interact with more? You have Siri, Google Assistant, Amazon Echo, all of these types of smart devices that use forms of artificial intelligence uh, to, be, to, to be helpful in your life. But if we think about those three things again, even if you can add sensors to, to it, it's really not taking physical action and affecting the world in the same way as we think of robots doing. So if we think of something that can act, you can imagine a remote control car. And there, you get the last piece. You get a device that can move. But really, you have a human holding the remote and controlling it, so it's not really uh, autonomous. It's not a robot on its own. It's more of a, a toy that belongs to your brain. All right. So that's what a robot is and what a robot isn't. But what makes a robot smart? And there are a couple of different aspects we can think about to, when we consider how do we define what a smart robot is. So one of the aspects is that we want a robot that's adaptable. So how does this robot manage to complete whatever task you're giving it, even if its environment changes? So say you have a robot that's trying to, you know, to reach the trash can, and you put a chair in the way. Can it adapt to that change in its environment? Second, is the robot robust? So instead of what if the environment around the robot changes, what if something happens to the robot itself? Uh, for example, if it has wheels and one of those wheels breaks, is your robot still able to achieve its task? Third, is the robot interactive? So if we think of robots uh, acting in the world, they're usually not going to act on their own. There will be other robots around or even other humans around. And we have to think about how can a robot achieve its goals if there's other people or other robots in the world around it. And lastly is the robot autonomous. Can the robot do something on its own without a human sort of holding its hand and guiding it and telling it what to do along the way? So we're going to keep these four components in mind as we think about how we're defining a smart robot. And all of these four pieces together, we can think of what makes a robot high performance. So can it consistently do the job in the face of all of these different challenges that it could encounter? Other people, changes to itself and its environment, and a lack of guidance. But sometimes these, uh, these four different things can involve a trade-off. Uh, for example, if we think about a robot that's helping in a factory, we could try and make a robot that's very independent and very autonomous. So here we have these big factory robots uh, that's doing some large-scale manufacturing. And it's got these really big heavy objects. It can move around. It can move these pieces, these really heavy things, very well. But if a human got in the way of that, things would not go well for the human. So this robot is very autonomous. It can do this job very consistently on the assembly line. But it's not interactive. It's not meant to deal with any other people or any other robots that are around it. On the flip side, we could have a cooperative robot. Here we have a robot called Baxter, and as you can see, there's a person also working right next to this robot on this assembly line. And the robot here is designed to be interactive. You can see that it's even got a screen there with eyes. And the reason for that is because we, as humans, look at other people's eyes to figure out where they're looking, what they're doing, and what their intentions are. So they made a robot that's meant to be interactive and work with people. The flip side is you can tell this is a much smaller robot. So they made the trade-off here that this robot isn't as strong, and can't do much, as much on its own, but they made an interactive robot for the specific situations where that's useful. All right, to sum together these parts of what a smart robot is, we talked about how uh, we have a brain and a body work together to make a smart robot. And now we've broken that down a little bit, that the brain part is doing the thinking and deciding. You add in the sensing and acting that the body has to do. And together, the goal is to create a robot that's adaptable, robust, interactive, and autonomous. So before we move on to getting into more details about the brain part, does anyone have any questions on their overview? By the way, these are robot soccer players. <laughs> the goal is eventually to beat a World Cup team, but we're nowhere near that yet either. <laughs> All right. Yes? Yeah. You were showing us the tortoise robot, I think it was called, in the beginning. Was that like really like, was there a computer inside of it or was it just like a mechanical thing that just moved, moves on its own? So the question was, does the tortoise robot have a computer in it? And back in 1948, we didn't have computers yet as we think of them now. Um, so those were mostly uh, mechanical and analog in a sense. So there weren't digital circuits inside of that, okay. inside of that robot. So yeah, it wouldn't be the, what we might think of as a robot now, but it still meets those three criteria. And we would probably see that, and if we saw it moving, we would think of it as behaving like we would expect a robot to behave. 
Yes? So is it the physical movement that really defines a robot then? Because you mentioned these like arms in the, in the assembly line are kind of programmed to just you know, pick up an item and move it to the next thing. And that to me, it's like how comparing to like a computer program that you're telling your computer to you know, move one file to another folder. It's sort of the same thing intuitively, but one is a robot and one is not a robot. Yeah, so your, your question is, is it the physical part that defines a robot? So in essence, that's what's the difference between an AI and a computer or something like that, an artificial intelligence and something that's a robot. And yes, it's that physical part that we think of as differentiating it. Because that computer sitting on a desk that's moving files can't really change the world around it. Whereas one thing that we think about distinguishing a robot uh, like a human is that it can change its environment and can affect its f the physical space in a way that uh, just the circuits alone without the robot can't do. All right, so let's talk some more about robot brains. So the important thing to think about here is how are we making a robot intelligent? The first question then is what is intelligence? We gave sort of a general overview of this before, but there are a lot of different ways to think about intelligence, and this is something that humanity has, has thought about for, for ages. So one of the definitions that we've traditionally used for intelligence, and one that you might think of when you think of what makes a person smart, is IQ, the intelligence quotient. And this is what we use as a standardized test of human intelligence. This is a way to compare people, but it doesn't necessarily encompass everything that we're interested in in terms of intelligence. It looks at specific kind of bookish smarts. So what's another way we could think about intelligence? Well, computer scientists started thinking about this very early on, and Alan Turing, one of the fathers of computer science, came up with what's now called the Turing test. And the question you consider here is, do you have a machine whose performance is indistinguishable from a human? So if you have a person chatting with, uh, with a chatbot on a computer, can they tell whether they're talking to a human or whether they're talking to a, a machine? And if a machine is able to convince the human that it is in fact human, it's considered to have passed the Turing test. But like intelligence, the intelligence quotient, what we're looking at here is our def definition of intelligence is like a human. But in reality, a lot of the things we're interested in having robots achieve are not like humans. And this gets back to the point we made before about high performance. We left that very vague before, and a reason for that is the, the types of goals that you want robots to achieve, what they need to do to be considered smart, can vary a lot. And they're not always human-like tasks. So we could imagine a robot whose job is to put something in boxes, and that's kind of a human-like task, but we wouldn't consider a human necessarily intelligent to achieve that. But we could also imagine sending a robot to Mars, and they're the types of things we want it to do, like shoot lasers to look at samples. That's not a very human-like task. And if you want a drone flying overhead that's doing something, whatever that drone's trying to achieve, humans can't fly. So what we're thinking about as intelligence and smart and high performance isn't necessarily going to be like what a human is going to achieve. But with that in mind, let's look at a robot that we're going to try and make smart. So let's make Trashbot. Uh, Trashbot has a very simple goal in life. Trashbot's goal is to find trash and put it in a trash can. <laughs> I guarantee you, robots can get a little more complicated than this. But let's start with the simple case. So there are certain things that Trashbot has to do to achieve this. The first thing Trashbot has to do is it has to find the trash. Next, it has to go and pick up the trash, take the trash to the trash bin, and deposit the trash inside of the trash bin. But how do we make Trashbot achieve this? If we just to told a robot, do those four things, it, it won't be able to do it. So the challenge is, how do we make Trashbot achieve this? And this is where we think of a lot of different ways to design a robot brain, in essence, to achieve this type of task. So let's start with a simple one. We imagine that uh, Trashbot has a certain state, has a certain goal that it's trying to achieve at one point. And we say the first thing it's doing is searching for trash. Once it finds the trash, and it, it can then transition into a new state, and we'll say its job there is collecting trash. Once it picks up the trash, then its state is traveling to the trash bin. Once it reaches the trash bin, that transition, then it deposits the trash and it can move back to the original state of searching for trash. And so we actually came up with a fancy name for this. This is called a finite state machine. And the reason for this is because there are certain states, here we have four of them, 
and which is a not infinite number, so it's just a finite number of states for this machine. But what happens if Trashbot drops the trash on its way to the trash bin? Uh-oh, what state are we in now? So the challenge here is if you're trying to use something like a finite state machine, probably one a little more complicated than this, you have to plan for everything that Trashbot might encounter. So we can come back to our four definitions then. So if we have this finite state machine Trashbot and those four definitions or four ideas, how smart can we consider Trashbot? So we need some audience participation here. So Trash, so we talked about adaptable. Can this robot adapt to changes in its environment? So I want you to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Is Trashbot adaptable? Yeah. We talked about that. If something changes, Trashbot's in trouble. Is Trashbot robust? If something happens to Trashbot itself, like a wheel breaks, is Trashbot still going to be able to achieve its goal? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yeah. We're in trouble on the robust front, too. Is Trashbot interactive? Can it work with others, robots or humans, in its environment? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Nope, not the way we've designed it, at least. And lastly, is it autonomous? Can it do this on its own? Hey, one for four. Yeah, so we've, we've achieved one of the important things that it needs to do, and it could achieve this goal sort of if everything goes right. But clearly, this is not the state of the art, and this is probably not how humans and other animals are achieving something like throwing out the trash. So let's dig into a little bit more about where Trashbot ran into trouble. It wasn't adaptable to its environment or robust to changes about itself. So let's look at another approach we could take. And that we could imagine we could make the machine learn. Machine learning, great term. But, <laughs> and the idea here is that we might, we, we might not be able to think ahead about everything that Trashbot is going to encounter. So we need to make Trashbot learn just like we learn. And the idea here is kind of simple. You do what you do, you change what you do based off of your experience. You try something, you see if it works, you get feedback in some way, find out if you were right, and then you change your model or change your plan for the next time. And here we're not explicitly programming our robot. We're not telling it ahead of time exactly what it's going to do at every state. But uh, we're letting it learn from the experiences that it encounters. So first we had this case that we ran into before. So Trashbot had this certain situation where I had to just pick up the trash and put it in the trash can. And now we could imagine it exposing it to different experiences. Say this time the trash is a can instead of this crumpled paper. Or the trash can is in a different place. Or the trash can is in fact a different trash can. Or maybe even a recycling bin. Or you could have a toddler running around that the trash bot has to worry about avoiding. Or lastly, there could be some obstacle in the way. For all we know, there might be a Greek statue that suddenly appears between trash bot and the trash can. So if we expose Trashbot to enough of this, we could imagine we could find a way to make Trashbot learn, right? How do we do that? We're going to steal from biology or borrow from brains. And here we're going to take the idea of neurons. These are your brain cells. And if you, we're not going to get into the depths of the biology here, but there are three important things that you can think of these brain cells as doing. So the first thing is they connect to inputs. And this could be the sensing that we talked about before, what you see from your, your retina and your eye cells. It integrates those signals in some way that we're not going to worry too much about. And then in the end, it generates some output that can get passed on to other neurons in a network, which is a neural network. So as we talked about before, it's made up of neurons, and they form in your brain or in other biological networks. You have, uh, you have these large networks of neurons uh, like this. This is from a rat brain, an image of a, of a part of a rat brain. But these can get really, really complex. In the human brain, for example, there are 86 billion neurons. So that's a little hard to throw 86 billion neurons into Trashbot and figure out how to make that all connect and learn. So we take a simpler approach, artificial neural networks, or sometimes we're lazy and just call them neural networks. And here you could imagine you have these inputs from whatever our sensors are. We go through some layers of more neurons that connect to each other, and at the end we get an output. Did Trashbot get the trash in the can, for example? So if we imagine trying to give Trashbot a lot of examples, we feed it all of these different cases as inputs, and then it, it practices, you can create some really complex behavior. We don't have to anticipate everything. As long as we let Trashbot experience enough, we hope that it'll be able to figure out how to do these types of things. So here, we have the problem that Trashbot needs to learn. And to learn, you need a lot of data and experience. 
You think about you didn't know how to read or walk the first time you tried it, presumably, so you just need a lot of practice. But the problem is, robots need a lot more practice at this than humans do, because we haven't figured out how to design the neurons yet, or the neuron, neural networks. So you can imagine, we could create a computer version of this. The computer can do it a lot faster. We can do a simulation of what the robot is experiencing. But it turns out, if you do a simulation, it's not quite the same as the real world. So if you practice it in a simulation, trash bots still might have trouble in the real world. So the last problem here with learning is that it's hard to learn what they never saw. So if Trashbot has never seen anything like what it encounters, you're still going to run into some of the same problems that you ran into with the state machine. And lastly, neural networks can be really hard to understand for humans. So if we uh, think of our state machine, we can figure out what was going on in each part of that because we made it. The problem is if you train a neural network, it can be really hard to figure out what each of these neurons represents in that once it's uh, trained itself. But that doesn't, hasn't stopped people from making, using neural networks to train robots and to teach robots to learn. So this is a video from Google where they used a neural network to train a robot and they had 14 robots practicing this task of grasping an object and picking it up. They had them practice for 3,000 hours for a total of 800,000 trials of picking up objects. I don't think it took you guys 800,000 times picking up an object to figure out how to do it. So clearly, there's a little ways we've got to go to be able to make neural networks work for robots. So let's think about this as we, like we thought about for the finite state machine. How smart is a robot trained with a neural network? Is it adaptable to changes in its environment? Yeah, I see some mixed thoughts, but it's more adaptable than our state machine. Uh, it can handle changes as long as it's seen something related before. Is it robust to changes in the robot itself? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, I see some mix there. But in general, it's, it's better than, than the state machine again. So if you imagine that you, you had the robot train with cases where there were something went a little haywire with the robot, it could possibly learn how to handle that. Is the robot, as we talked about it, interactive? Can it interact with others in its environment? Yeah, I see a little more mixed there. In the case we've talked about it, it's not really interactive. Again, you'd have to think about how you would train it to do that, uh, but it's trickier because you have to think about how others are going to behave as well. And lastly, is this robot autonomous? Can it work on its own? Yeah, so once we've trained it all up, then it can work on its own. You know, there are a lot of sort of ifs to what I've talked about and sort of like edge cases as we think of it where it might be able to do it. But we haven't really talked about how you make the robots interactive and work with others. So let's dig a little bit more into that case. This is the idea of intelligence by working together. Whoa, I didn't know my watch could make sound. <laughs> um, so if we think about intelligence by working together, we do this as people and as animals. So you think of bees working together. You don't look at one bee functioning on its own, but you have hives of bees working together. One of them might go and identify a food source, then it comes back, tells the others about that food site, Here's the top search and, result. <laughs> uh, and they can then feed the entire colony that way. We also see ants that work together. This is a, a picture actually taken by someone in our lab when they went to go study ants, these army ants that actually build structures out of themselves. Their entire nest is built out of ants. They build bridges out of themselves to reach, uh, to reach food sites. And they couldn't do this as a single individual. And even humans work together uh, to achieve tasks they couldn't on their own. One of these people couldn't move the statue, but working together, you have some form of collective intelligence as we talk about it. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, I'm going to have you guys play a game together. So there's two important parts to this. So first of all, I'm going to have you all start clapping. It's not a play for applause, I promise. And once you've started that, I'm going to give you a second instruction, so listen for that. On your marks, get set, go. All right, now I want you to start clapping together at the same time. Nice! You got that really quickly. It took you probably a couple of seconds to figure out how to clap together. And so this is what we would call emergent behavior. So each of you wasn't trying to figure out exactly one time. You didn't all have the same rule. We're going to clap every half second on the spot. You were all listening to those around you. You were following a simple rule to sort of adjust your timing 
to match other people, and very quickly you all manage to synchronize. And we're not the only ones that do this. Dramatic lighting. <laughs> all right. So it turns out that fireflies, in fact, do kind of the same thing. So this is a video of fireflies all synchronizing to flash at the same time, just like you were doing with clapping. The idea here is that once they're doing this, they all light up at the same time, so collectively they're brighter. So there's an advantage to that. But of course, the firefly on the far left can't necessarily see the firefly on the far right. And so they're just listening to those around them. They're following simple rules for uh, local rules around their own little neighborhood of fireflies. And they can all end up synchronizing as a group from these simple rules to create complex behavior in the whole group. So this is what we call emergent behavior. Uh, as I said, you have the simple rules creating complex behavior in a larger group. And we see this also in uh, termites, for example, that they're able to build these huge mounds, eight feet tall or something like that, when the individual termites are maybe two centimeters tall or two centimeters long. And we even see this with ourselves. We imagine ourselves as very complex beings. But you think about a roundabout, or even this completely preposterous roundabout in the UK that they call the magic roundabout, with five small roundabouts that feed into one large roundabout. But everyone is following simple rules, and if everyone follows those traffic rules that we all have, you manage to create this very smooth traffic flow, except for a few crashes, that you wouldn't necessarily think that humans would be, have the same sort of emergent behavior. And we can also end up applying this to robots. And this is what we call collective robotics. And this is the project that I work on. So we have robots that are called kilobots. And they're called that because we have 1,024 of these robots. I have them here and I get to show them to you afterwards. And they're a little bit like bugs. So each of them is, you know, maybe two inches wide. And they can only sense or communicate with robots that are up to six inches away from them. And all they can do is they can say how far away that neighbor is, and they can tell you how bright it is. That's all they can do. And all of these robots run the exact same simple program. But we can actually see this kind of emergent behavior for if we give them the right rules to follow. For example, one of the early things that these robots were created for was something called self-assembly. And the idea here is that all of these little robots will make some much larger shape or object out of themselves, kind of like those army ants. And so this is a, a project that, uh, that people from my lab worked on. And here you can see you want to make a star shape out of this giant glob of robots. And they each take their turn to follow along the edge of this glob and into the shape. And once they think that they're in the shape, they stop moving. So they don't have a specific spot that they're trying to be in the shape. They don't necessarily know ahead of time where they're going to end up. Neither, none of them has a particular uh, specific job in this, in this task. But you, you see this behavior of the shape emerging when they're all following these simple rules. They're a little bit slower than the ants. This took, as you can see, 11 hours. <laughs> um, but as you say, we haven't figured out how to make the robots as smart as real life yet. So thinking about this, how smart are collective robotics? Keeping in mind here that this is what I work on, so I'm a little bit biased. So are the robots adaptable to their environment? Yeah, if you, if you think about some, some changes, if you have enough of them, they can ad adapt to things. Are they robust? And here, yeah, I see yeah, people from my lab giving a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, we can think about them now not as an individual, but we think about the whole group as our, as our case of being robust. So if I took out one of those kilobots doing the self-assembly, the rest of the group would still be able to make the shape. Just like if you took one bee out of a hive, the hive's not going to go haywire unless it's the queen, but <laughs> are these robots interactive? Yeah, by definition, our goal was to make interactive robots. And are these robots autonomous? Yeah, we give them a program, we set them all loose, and they're able to work on their own. So to summarize what we've learned about robot brains, we've learned about a couple of different approaches and they all have some trade-offs. So state machines are easy for us to understand uh, and we could imagine them being on the easier side to program, but it's hard to cover every possibility that we might encounter. We looked at neural networks, which can create much more complex behavior, and they're a lot more flexible than state machines, but they're hard to train, especially for something that has to work in the physical world, and they're hard for us to understand and be able to predict what the robots might do. And we talked about collective robots, which they created with interactivity in mind, 
But it's hard to figure out how do you design a rule that one robot will follow that will create some sort of complex behavior in the whole group. So we've sort of cheated a little bit though, because the reality is that there's no one size fits all, and none of these approaches are really functioning on their own. So we could imagine that we have Trashbot, but now we have a collective of trash bots. We don't have one robot that's going to collect trash for the entire world. So we're gonna have robots working together. And you could imagine that you could also train Trashbot using a neural network to figure out how to pick up trash like we saw the Google robots doing. And you could also imagine on top of that that there are different states that this robot goes through to complete this task, like its job of picking up that uses the neural network, then some sort of different uh, state where its goal is to travel back and you train something to do to plan a path back to the trash can. So the reality is that a lot of these techniques are end up being used together and the future is not thinking of one approach that's going to solve every single problem in robotics but thinking about how we can use the right tool for the right task. So does anyone have any questions about the entire topic of brains and robots? Yes? <coughs> well, I have multiple questions. Uh, one of those is um, uh, which you you have a specific a specific pro program programming language to, to do like I will give an example if you want to program an Arduino for example you have these like a, a static instructions mm -hmm. you know but when you make this kind of robots like uh, they work with each other or something is 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 something more complex than like for example C plus plus Visual yeah. Basic, those are like a very linear when you put ifs and things like that, very static, but those kind of other uh, uh, scope or objectives, those are a different, yeah. like a programming language or something? Yeah, so the question is how do we program these robots? Is there a certain programming language and what does the structure of that program look like to make these robots do it? And there is the, the language is sort of a tool, so you could imagine that you can give a speech in any language. You can program a robot in Python or C++ or any other programming language. Um, what ends up looking different is the structure of that. And if you think of something like with the state machine, you could imagine a lot of statements were like, if this, then do that. If this, then do that. Uh, but something more complex like a neural network, you still might end up writing that program in some programming language that you might have heard of, but the program itself will end up looking different at the end. Um, but there's, there's not like, there's, there's no magic bullet or no, in the sense of what one specific programming language that makes all robots work best. If that makes sense. Yes? For the uh, neural network uh, example, like the Google uh, example you showed, can you transfer the knowledge from one, that one robot learns to, say, your replica of that robot so that it doesn't have to go through? 8,000 hours yeah. of training? <laughs> yeah, so the, this is the challenge of transfer learning. How do you make one robot, train, train one robot, for example, and make other robots use that information and not have to relearn from scratch? And if it were, say, exactly the same model of robot, then yeah, you could probably put that on there. It might take a little bit to adjust if its motors are just a little bit different, for example. Um, but then say you took that program that the Google robots trained on and you put it on a very different robot arm, like one of those factory ones. That's a really big question, a really big challenge in, in this challenge of uh, like neural networks and machine learning, is how do you learn one thing and then adapt it to another task or another machine? So if you think about the fact that you learned how to pick up a book, you didn't have to relearn from scratch how to pick up a basketball. Uh, but robots aren't quite as good at th that yet as in this challenge of, of transfer learning is actually what we call it as well. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious as to uh, how you would categorize nanotechnology, which, uh, from what I understand, is the ability to have machine-like uh, particles that are microscopic size that can be taught to swarm, can be taught to do different actions, activities, some level of intelligence. So how does nanotechnology relate to this? Well, if you're thinking of you, there's some sort of way people think of as molecular robotics or materials based approaches where there's something in the nature of some very small piece that uh, it reacts with what's around it uh, to say like form shapes or form structures. 
And I think, the, I think if I understand what you're describing, um, this wouldn't necessarily fall into what we think of as robotics in the sense that we've talked about it here. If you imagine that it's the physical structure of some small particles that causes it to form shapes, for example, uh, you have it sensing its environment and you have it acting, but there's no real thought in that. It's just sort of a reaction to the space around it. Um, I'm a little unclear on what you mean by a sensor in this case. Well, it detects something in the environment and reacts. Yeah, I mean, you could have, say, like, if you, have, if you think of chemistry, you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and they'll attract. But just because they stick together because of those charges doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to call that a robot. But the, we, we gave you a very clean definition of what a robot is, but even roboticists will argue about what a robot is. So it's always a little more complicated. All right. Yes? What did you have to program into the kilobots to get them to form the star? Slash what? How much is it like thinking about, thinking as a human about kind of simple instructions that you give, and how much can it be emergent from them? Yeah, so the question is, how do you program kilobots to make a star? Well, there it is. I didn't do that program. So uh, I, the, that was a, a postdoc before I started. Um, but some of it is thinking as a human about, well, if we wanted to achieve this global structure, what local rules can we give individual robots? So we think of that as what's called like the, like the local to global problem, or the global to local problem. If we have a global goal, how do we figure out what local rules the robots need to follow? And we don't have a, a golden ticket for that. So we have to think about so those things individually. That would be sort of the holy grail of collective robotics, would be to figure out um, some rule where we say, we want, to, we want to do this job with the whole group, what local rule can we give to a robot? Um, and it would sort of automatically figure that out, but we're nowhere near that yet. Yes? Are those robots only able to make the star, or are there any other shapes? So we can program them uh, to do whatever we want within limits. So one of the things that I'm working on right now with those robots is having them make decisions as a group. And also afterwards, I'll have a couple of different demos of different things that they can do collectively, including the synchronization, like the fireflies. Perfect. Hi. Just to reintroduce myself, I'm Buse. I'm from Turkey. I'm a second year PhD student in the School of Engineering, and I'm going to talk about robot bodies. So a reminder from Julia's slide, so we said what makes a robot? So it's the brain and the body. The brain thinks, yeah, you can think that, oh, it'd be so nice if I went to this lecture that Julia and Buse did, but if you didn't have legs, you would not make it here. So I'm going to talk about how to make a good body and how to make that adaptable, robust, interactive, and autonomous. So first I'm going to ask you a question. What does a robot's body look like? What do you think of when you think of a robot? What is it made of? What does it look like? What kind of features does it have? Anybody? Legs. Legs. Yeah, that's good. Anything else? What? Yeah. R2-D2. Yeah, I actually have a photo of that, so that's a good <laughs> You were going to say something. I was just saying it would be task-oriented. Yeah. yeah. So let's look at some photos from movies or things. So we said legs, maybe eyes or cameras, right? And usually what we think of is steel and hard plastics, right? Wally, we really, me and Julia wa love Wally, so we're going to have photos of it a lot. Iron Man, right? Eyes, a little bit human like. Those are the kind of things we think of. Or from cartoons, R2D2, you just mentioned it. Things like that. So, or drones, that's another one. So that it doesn't have to have wheels and legs to move forward. Maybe it has propellers and wings and it's flying. And it has a little camera, so that's how it senses. But have they always looked like this? So now that's what we think of robots. So I'm gonna go way back in history. So Julia talked about the tortoise, which was in the 1900s. So robot bodies actually existed way before robot brains did. So let's look at automaton. This is little Pinocchio. It, it is pretty autom uh, autonomous, because it, it has a task. It's just going through the wheels. It's, it's going through a bike. What is an automaton? It's basically a mechanical device. It's kind of human-like. That's how it's always expected. It's, it has a preset sort of direction. So it's like, oh, roll this, 
or just like pick this up and put it there, and it performs some sort of a function. So it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't think and make decisions on its own, but this is how the history of things needs to be. And this is like machines doing tasks for us. And like if we go like even before Christ, Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher, said that automata someday is going to bring equality to humanity because it's going to get rid of slavery. Because then we can have robots do our jobs. Now we're worried about that, but <laughs> then it was exciting. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite inventors, Muslim inventor from the second um, from the 12th century, Al Jazeera. This is the basin. So this is one of his sketches. If you want to see original sketches, go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. There's a few there. So how does it work? There's a little bird. The bird says something, and then water goes through these channels, and it's poured into a basin. And then there's a duck there that drinks the water, and then it pees the water out, and then it, it's just disposed. So this is like a very early robot. Let's go to Da Vinci. So Da Vinci made a knight in armor. So it moved its hands up and down, it moved its jaw, and it moved its head around. That's what it did. 1495. And then this is, I don't know if any of you know this, von Kempelen, he's a Hungarian inventor, 1700s. And this is called the Turk. I'm Turkish, so maybe I'm a little biased to put that here, but he's a chess player. And he played Benjamin Franklin. He played Napoleon Bonaparte. He won in all of them. Um, so it would just win chess games. How did it do it? Did it think? Did it decide? Does anybody have any guesses? Does anybody know the history of this? Yes. There was a man inside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really good robot body because it moves all these chess pieces and it actually, so from underneath, the person could see where the little pegs went so they could know. And then they actually had a demo where they would like open the front and then the man would hide in the back and then they would open the door in the back, open the, and then they're just like, oh, there's nobody in there. This was a legend for like many years. Edgar Allan Poe has an essay on it. So, but it's a very fun little story. So now I'm gonna go, so in these, like even after the 1700s, robots didn't develop much until the Industrial Revolution. So let's go to actual robots. This is the first robot that was kind of sold and used in the industry. It's a robotic arm. So after this part of the lecture, you're gonna see a lot of arms because most robots are arms and hands. Um, this is called the Unimit. Um, it was found by this guy called George DeVoe. And him and his partner, um, business partner, <laughs> had a comp formed a company, the first robotic company. But they were like, we can't call it a robot. Robots are only like in these really weird um, like science fiction papers, so they're not going to believe that it's an actual product that's useful. We should call it some other thing. But then they're like, no, let's call it a robot. Now robotics is a field. I can call myself a roboticist and be taken seriously, which is kind of nice. <laughs> but this is an article from the New York Times from then. Machine-like men are still toddlers. So this is a quote from there. Sightless, unable to perceive his environment and take action based on what he learns. Clyde, which was the name of one robot in one company, but the same arm that you're looking at, is hardly in the league of robots, cyborgs, and androids of science fiction. I mean, this is a trend you probably are seeing with my, um, my part of and Julia's part. Our science fiction and robots are always ahead of where we're actually at and making them. So this is a little example, but we kept making the arms better. This is another one. It's a six-axis industrial robot. It can carry 1,000 kilograms and has a reach of 32 meters around it. So it's huge, massive, much stronger than a human. It's, it was the world's largest and strongest six-axis industrial robot, and it's in the Guinness Book of Records. Six-axis doesn't mean anything to you now, but hopefully it will mean in a few slides when I explain what that means. And then now, this was an example that Julia also showed earlier, the KUKA factory arms. These are used a lot in cases where there's huge objects that you're carrying around and you need something that's stronger than human hands. And so some data, so in like these years, there's like more than 1.3 million industrial robots that are in, fac in factories. So there are a lot in factories. So we were talking about what a robot looked like. We looked at some examples. But looking at these things, they're stereotypically, they're human inspired. You were saying legs. They have legs. They have arm and hands because they need to pick up things, hold on to things. And there's usually taking care of human tasks or like really large tasks that humans can't do. And they're usually made of rigid components, all these examples traditionally. So steel, aluminum, hard plastics. And that means that they're controlled by joints and motors. 
because you have all these rigid parts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? So we call this rigid body movement. <laughs> and this is a just a simple arm. So assume I have no elbow right now. And this is one degree of freedom. So what this robot can do right now, it can do this. That means the only thing I can touch is this periphery. So that red line is the only thing I can reach with my arm. And that's one degree of freedom. My brain has to make only one decision. Where does the shoulder go? And then that's one decision. So let's add my elbow into it. What's going to happen? It's two degrees of freedom, and I can start doing all these crazy movements. Let's look at some of the examples. So that means I can cover this whole range. So that's, of course, much better. But if this isn't only in 2D, I only gave 2D examples. So if you want to do this in 3D, you're actually going to need six degrees of freedom. That's why the six-axis factory arm was super important, because that meant it could reach all different, like three different of freedom, and it could do all these manipulation to the object in its hand. So this is great, but why do we always rigid, use rigid parts? This is the comparison of the one degree to the two degree. So the more degrees you add, the more freedom you will have. So rigid components are precise and accurate. This is great because just imagine I have a steel rod and I'm trying to touch a point on this table. It's going to be pretty easy, right? It's strong. If I hit it, I can make a really loud noise, and it's really fast. Why I'm not using soft things? Because if it was just a pillow or this rubber rod, it's going to get floppy. It's going to touch the ground. It's going to be really weak. It's going to be super slow. But is rigid always better than soft and robots? Soft things can also be nice. Just They can be adaptable. They can be because they're going to conform to different shapes. They're safe and human friendly. If I hit something with a rubber um, rod, it's not going to hurt as much as a steel ruler, right? Or if you think of the factory arms, those are very detrimental. To, if you tell the robot to do this, if it's made of a rigid component, even if there's a human here, it's just going to go that way. But if it's a soft compliant thing, it won't. And they're very sturdy, because if you break a rigid component, you can have like a huge catastrophic failure. If it's a soft thing, you won't have that big of a failure. So compared to that, as I said, rigid things are more uncompromising. They'll just go through the human, they can be dangerous, and they're pretty fragile. So there is another paradigm in robots that I'm going to talk more about, soft robots. So this has been a new field, probably like 20, a little more than 20 years. What do you think of when I say a soft robot? Does anybody have any? Like a software robot? Ah. Software. By soft, I mean squishy and cuddleable. <laughs> So Baymax is uh, f from Big Hero 6, if you've watched it, it's a really good movie, talks about soft robotics very well. Let's look at other examples. These are grippers. So if I want to hold tomatoes, I don't want to hold tomatoes or an egg with metal fingers that's gonna, it's gonna, just going to break it. Or I have to be really precise with where the finger goes. But if I have a rubber thing to hold it, we can hold very gentle objects. Or it'll be like that human can get out of that really quickly. Another example, this is an example from Harvard as well, from the Whitesides group. These are, these are made out of rubber. They have air channels inside it. So this is meant for to be adaptable in different kinds of locomotion. So you see now it's work, walking as it has four feet. And then it's going to drop down, and it's going to go through under the little glass there. So a rigid robot might not have been able to squeeze through a tiny space like that. It, they're, they're still very slow. <laughs> going through like that. <laughs> you can do it. So it's entirely made out of squishy material. It's just rubber, cast rubber. I'm going to keep going because I don't want to wait for him or her. <laughs> and then this is another example of a robot integrated to a human. So these are just basically little balloons on a finger. This is also from a lab at Harvard. And basically, if you inflate these balloons, it's going to help you grip. So this is used for post-stroke patients or spinal cord injury patients who have less strong grips. And if you try to help them hold things, you, it senses that you're trying to grip something, and it just inflates the balloons and helps you hold. So it's a robot in inter integration. Could you imagine that KUKA arm doing something on the human body? Probably not. So this we call mechanical intelligence. So you're like, what is this? We're talking about smartness. Why is this smart? This is smart because it's mechanically smart. You're designing the components so that it can be um, adaptable to its environment. So it kind of makes it more autonomous because it can make decisions. It's like, oh, it's a tomato. It has this shape, so I'm going to hug it like this. 
So rather than you having to, because here, as I said, I have two degrees of freedom, three with my wrist, I have to think, where's this going to go? Where's this going to go? Where's this going to go? But if I did that with a soft robot, I just inflate it and it just does this. No matter what, who's here, I'm going to be able to hug that person, no matter how fat or skinny they are, <laughs> if I were a soft robot. <laughs> so this is sort of the comparison to remind you. But rigid robots, as I said, are human inspired most of the time, and they have rigid components. Soft robots, they're mostly biologically inspired. Octopuses, starfish, things, mostly marine biology is super inspiring for us soft roboticists. And they're made out of soft components. You saw a lot of rubber examples. We have some fabric examples too, foam. And then they're usually controlled not by joints and motors, but by cables and air and liquids. So it's a very different paradigm. You don't think of degrees of freedom as much because you have infinite degrees of freedom because you can just basically bend your arm however form you want. But we did talk about things, rigid things having a good component to them too. They're fast. You saw how slow that little star-shaped robot was when trying to go through the thing. They're not as strong. They can't really provide that much force. Yeah, it's picking up an egg. Is it going to be able to pick up a steel block? Probably not. And they're not as precise as accurate. You inflate it, it's just going to do some weird thing. You won't be able to do the ex exact hug you want it to do to the object you're trying to grab. So can we get the best of both worlds? Do you guys think we can? Yes, yes that's why I exist. That's my research. We're going to call it variable stiffness. So to be able to help you imagine what changing stiffness, changing from stiff, rigid and soft means, we're going to imagine you're arm wrestling with somebody. So if you're arm wrestling with a baby, you're probably going to make your arm stiffness very low. You're going to be really floppy and you're going to let the baby win, hopefully, if you're not a mean person. If it's a strong athlete with a lot of muscles, you're going to try really hard and you're going to have a stiff, stiff arm. So you're not moving your arm around too much, but you're playing with the stiffness. And so how do we do that? We do that by co-contracting our muscles. So that's basically you pull your arm to this side and to this side at the same time and you increase your stiffness. So that's one way you can do it on a robot. That's what I mean by multiple cables and wires. So you can pull on this joint from both sides and make it stiffer. That's how sort of tents stay up. You can use temperature. There's some things that are activated through temperature or voltage. You can use things activated through voltage that change properties as you put electrical current through them. Again, you can use magnetic field. If you have more questions about these, I can answer them. But most importantly, I'm going to talk about pressure. So what do I mean? I'm going to get to my research, which is jamming. So what is jamming? Is it a jam session when you do like in music? Is it jam that you eat and put on your peanut butter and jelly? Is it a printer jam? Is it a traffic jam? The first two, no. The second two, kind of. So this sentence is my PhD in its entirety. When you squeeze things really tight, the overall structure becomes really stiff. That's like my five years of my life is going to be. <laughs> but hopefully I'm going to walk through it. So let's take layers of paper. And let's put it in a bag. And then, there's a lot here, so you're going to be able to play it with them later. And let's connect the vacuum to it. And let's turn the paper on, the vacuum on. So we squeeze it really tight using the vacuum. So what the vacuum does, it just pressurizes it. I could have just squeezed it with my hands, and it's the same idea. What happens, I'm just going to first start with a video. So the vacuum off and vacuum on stage, you can see that the stiffness is very different. And you can see that you can carry very different amounts of load. The initial one just fails the tiny one, the other one is strong and sturdy. So we, maybe we can get rigid and soft at the same time. How does this work? Because friction is powerful. So I'm going to give an example. I have a bad version of this here that I intertwined by my bare hands. Two foam books intertwined with each other, and it's very difficult to tear them apart. You can come and try at the end as well. Why is this? Because friction is very powerful. So this is from Mythbusters, these photos. They could carry a car with two foam books intertwined. They just hung a car. And the first one is basically two tanks that are pulling apart. Maybe my intertwining skills weren't that good, but basically it should work because it's squeezing the layers really tight and it's doing a lot of it because there are many, many layers. So friction can be a good thing. Usually you try to avoid friction, but in our case, it's great. So what happens? So initially, when I'm not squeezing them really tight in the plastic bag, let's go back to the example, the layers are independent. They're just sliding. Then I turn the vacuum on, and then they just become like one cohesive thing. So then they become much stiffer. So to give you an idea, 
if I had 10 layers, it's going to get 100 times more stiffer. So if I have no vacuum on and I have 10 layers, it's going to carry one gram. But if I stiffen it, it's going to be able to carry 100 grams or 10 to 1,000. Another thing I want to talk about is slipping. So if the vacuum is on, it's not slipping, I'm putting some load. What if I keep pushing it if I'm a really strong person? Then it's going to start slipping and it's going to dissipate energy. So I'm going to try to explain what dissipating energy means through friction. So let's get a sled. Let's put a squirrel on one and an elephant on the other. And I'm going to push them and try to go, make them go as far as, I, as possible. They're trying to go. Do you guess who's going to win? Probably the squirrel, because it's much lighter. So how friction works is if you press something, you can even try it with your feet. If you press your feet really hard onto the ground, it's going to be more difficult to slide. But that means it's the, the elephant is releasing more of the energy. I gave the same amount of energy to both of them. The elephant got rid of it really quickly. The squirrel, on the other hand, used it till the very end and won the race. So let's see, and if we can try to get our little jamming structures, the ones that I showed you in the plastic bag, and put them under a weight and throw them to the ground. Can we control it so that it dissipates the energy that it's going through when it hits the ground? So what we did, I'm going to show you the video, but first I want to explain what we did. We put, again, the jamming structures under the drone, and then we tried to tune the stiffness of the legs of the drone. So if it's really stiff, it's going to be like a tripod. It's going to fall and then just like fall to its side. If it's too soft, if my legs were rubber, my butt was going to hit the ground. If it's like compliant enough, it's going to have a very smooth landing. So let's see it in action. So the initial one has no vacuum. I put little vacuum icons so that you can tell. So you can see that the middle one is actually the most ideal because the right one is too stiff. So the landing is too high impact for the drone. So if there was a human, they would get shocked and jostled around. But the middle one kind of shows that it's just the right, perfect, smooth landing. So jamming can be used for this as well. Another cool thing you can do, which is probably the thing that you guys are going to be able to feel here, is deforming the objects. So when you're deforming an object, like a spoon, you deform it and it stays like that. And if you try to do it too much, it's going to break. In these cases, you just turn the vacuum off and on, and you can reshape it however you want. It's much more easy to mold around. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. We call this plasticity because, you, because you're still slipping between the, um, between the layers. You're dissipating energy as you're changing your form. So it can go into whatever. These are, again, just 10 sheets of paper in a plastic bag. My research is very cheap. <laughs> so why is layer jamming great? It's tunable. You can tune the response, as I showed. It's very thin and conformable. It's super lightweight. It has a huge range. So out of the variable stiffness, you know I th talked about things with voltage, things with uh, magnets. This thing in the plastic bag actually has the highest range of all the different variable stiffness mechanisms out there, which are more difficult to explain, actually. So this is kind of lucky. Rapidly activated, you just turn the vacuum on. Very reversible, as I talked about with the spoon example. And they're super low cost, as I said. Super cheap printer paper. And it's good in different cases. So you can make it super stiff. You can tune it so it dissipates certain energy. And you can make it deform in any form you want. So basically what I talked about is how to make a smart robot body when you're trying to navigate the space between rigid and soft. So you can try to make structures like I'm doing that transition between the two so you try to get the best of both worlds. But that's not always a great thing because that's another decision that the robot has to make. It's kind of like what Julia was saying about the states and about the decisions. Like now, what if a, Gre like, what if a Greek sculpture comes? And now it's like, what if, my, um, what if the vacuum turns off? Or it could be, I need to make another decision. Should I turn it off? Should I be rigid? Should I be soft? That adds another dimension and increases the complexity of a robot, which might not be, be a good thing for your application. So for this section, does anybody have any questions? Yes? How the books apart? These one, I have to do it by, one by one. <laughs> you can help me. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Okay, now I'm going to go to how do we put these two together. So I talked about the body, Julia talked about the brain, now how do we make them work together? So let's remind ourselves, a little plot, 
So first it has to sense, that's through the body. I actually didn't talk this much about it, so mostly I talked about the acting part, because it's the part that's touching humans or other things in its environment, but you would do that through sensors, something like a camera. You decide, the brain makes a decision, or the human hidden inside the little box, <laughs> which doesn't make her a robot, and then it acts, it's a body. And then what were the criteria? In order for it to be high performance, we said it has to be adaptable, which means if the environment changes, it should, it should adapt itself. If something in its body falls apart, it should figure out what to do, robust. Interactive, it should work well with others, other robots, other humans. And it should be autonomous, it should make decisions on its own. So let's take an example. Let's go, let's focus on Trashbot. Yeah, Trashbot is gonna go find the trash, but he, Trashbot needs to grasp the trash, right? So let's think about grasping. How do you grasp an object? What kind of things do you need to do? First thing you need to do is to approach the object, right? And then you conform to the object, your hand, you adjust, adjust the tightness of your grip, and then you lift it. So I'm gonna go through them one by one. Approaching the object doesn't even have to do anything with the hand. You have to see it, you have to move your arm, you maybe have to walk towards it, so I'm not even gonna talk about that because that's gonna make it even more complicated. Conforming, okay, I'm here, the object is somewhere near. I basically use the joints of my hand to conform to the object. And then I need to adjust the tightness of the grip. Again, let's go to the egg example, or a really heavy one, or soap. Like, you can't have too tight of a grip on soap, because it's just going to fly off. So you need to sense. And then you're going to lift the object. So can we make a robot do this? So this is a robotic hand that came out of my lab. It's a startup now. There's an old example of it here, too. You're going to be able to feel it afterwards. So what does it have? Let's focus on it. It has compliant joints, so it has a soft component of it. So it has these joints that aren't motorized, and it's just basically rubber, you can see. And this makes it so that it's, the degree of freedom is not necessarily, so you don't necessarily know where this finger is, the end of the finger, because you don't have a joint that you control yourself, it just conforms. It has sensors, to it. it tries to sense the object. It has these sensors inside the tiny little ones in here, all throughout the finger. What it does, it's, it senses the pressure, it goes on it from the object. So how good is this hand? So it's really robust. I can drop it. It's still going to work. <laughs> um, we hit it with a hammer. It still worked. That's one of the good things about soft robots. It's autonomous because it grasps, it senses that the object is there. Is it adaptable? Not too much because if the robot is holding it in a weird way that it doesn't really, it hadn't done before, or it's in a way where it senses the object is there, but it's not a good grasp like we call that a quality grasp, then it's going to probably drop it when it's lifting it up. So it's not as adaptable. Can we use, how can we make the brain of this hand a little bit better? So what we did was we actually used neural networks, so we try to train the hands. But if we did all the hands, it's going to be like the example she showed in Google, where it's like so many hours and hours of work. So what we try to do is connect it with a physical model. So we know how much pressure you need to, you, you kind of can feel the weight of the object. You know your contact points in your hand. So we try to get a hybrid of what we know from the body and from physics, so we don't let the robot brain take care of everything. We use our engineer brains a little bit too. And then we try to combine the two. That's some of the current research that's going on now. So one thing I want to mention, and I want you to have this as a parting thought, is that robotics is inherently interdisciplinary. So it does a lot of things together. So you might think of different kinds of engineering. Yeah, of course, you need the circuits, you need the sensors, you need the soft and the rigid things, you need the neural nets. So you need to have electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, material science, chemical engineering. In some cases, there was a question about nanotechnology that could be utilized. But there's also these other things that you don't know, you might not consider initially. Like biology, we kind of both mentioned that soft robots are inherently biologically inspired, neural nets are biologically inspired, design and architecture, you have to design these things, they need to work in a building. Arts and crafts, I, I have a background in art, so I'm biased in that. Law, because robots are starting to work with humans, there's, we're starting to have bots, we need to govern them in a certain way. And psychology, because they work with people. So that's why I like robotics. I might not be that interested in robots, but I like the fact that we all have to come together to like make these things work, because robotics is a very systems level field. And now I want to part with thoughts about just like a historical perspective. So we started with these things. We started with a robot that's not actually a robot, but a human. Then we went into some hands, but then people, some arms that would grasp things and I had, they were super powerful, but then articles were like, they're still toddlers, they don't know, they can't sense that well. 
What's going on now? Where are robots? So Julia gave a few examples of these. They're in the industry. They're in factories. They're in education. A lot of schools these days have like robotics teams. I don't know if you guys are in any of them. But it's a good way to teach kids science, math, engineering skills from early on. Healthcare, we have surgical robots. We have great prosthetics. We have um, exoskeletons. Entertainment industry, we have a lot of toys that involve robots. Home, she showed the Roomba. And we're trying to get better at that. I'm going to talk about that. They're not too much at home. Transportation, we're thinking of like self-driving cars now. They're not out there yet, but people are working on that. Food and agriculture. So let's look at some photos of examples. They're in space, right? We showed the Mars rover. Roomba, they're at home. They're in surgery. This is Da Vinci, one of the surgical robots. This is agriculture. These basically put seeds on the floor as they're walking around. And this is an industrial robot in a factory. So the factory one is actually the most prominent one. Other ones, we don't have as many because the environment is very uncontrollable. Something like a Roomba works because it has a very simple task. But other things like, oh, home assistance overall, you can only have like Alexa that's not even a robot because it's just talking to you. So we still have a long way to go. And this is some news articles from the past six months. How babies learn and why robots can't compete. So as um, Julia showed, learning takes a lot of time with like the Google hand robots. You didn't learn how to grasp that long, so we can't, we shouldn't be worried about robots competing with us. Home robots still suck. So this little qu quote, I want to read, a robot that was supposed to be a conduit between human needs and other machines just didn't work. It's because like Roomba is really good because all it does is vacuum the floor, but if it's trying to integrate your experiences to the home, it's still very difficult to do that. Why a robot can't yet outjump a flea? So let's go back to the now we're comparing it to fleas now because we're bio-inspired, right? Fleas are so much better than robots at jumping. And the Atlas robot that we saw, it might be doing a parkour, but it still can't chase you up the stairs. So if there's something on the stairs case that it didn't predict that was going to be there before, it might fall down. So it, if it's coded in it, it's going to be do a good job. It's dynamically very good, but it's still not going to be integrated into your experience. And so I want to also like highlight some examples from research that's going on in Harvard in robotics. So the first one is a micro robot. I showed the flea. They're great. So now we're trying to get inspired by a really small object like bees. There's a robo bee that they're developing. Hammer, which is a cockroach inspired robot that they're developing. This is a tiny robot. The penny is there for skill and it's really strong and it can move around the platform on it very controllably. The second one is a sensor. It's a hydrogel sensor. Hydrogel is basically like a fi fancy jello with some technologies embedded to it, like a current going through it. But these are super flexible sensors that can be integrated and they're biodegradable and they're, they're biocompatible. Sorry, they're, you can put them on your skin or sometimes even inside of your body. So these are good sensors. So these are trying to develop the sensing part of the robot. And the second one is an exosuit example. So we're trying to make the robots sort of work well with humans. So we're trying to integrate it to their behavior and make them learn from the human's behavior, synchronize with their walk, if it's a walking aid robot. So there's a kind of the research that's going on in labs that aren't out there yet, but hopefully will be soon. The future from where this is going is in terms of brains and bodies. So brains are definitely going to learn more from their experiences. We're probably going to cater their experiences a little better. And they're definitely going to collaborate more to learn from each other's experiences as well, hopefully. And robot bodies, they're going to get squishier, much softer. They're going to get smaller. And initially, we were making them really big. Now, I think robotics is trying to make them really small. And they're going to be more mechanically versatile, able to do much more interesting tasks than we as humans can do with our bodies. That's my concluding slide. Do you have any general questions, either to me or to Julia? And if you don't, we can look at these things and talk more informally, too, if you don't want to ask a big question. What is your robot hands designed to do? These are for factories, so just to pick up objects from boxes and like package them into certain. So, they're, so the company that does this has to do it sort of integratedly. So right now, these kind of hands, they're, the picks are really robust, the pickups, like the grasps, but it can't really do it in a way that's very adaptable, as I said. So most of these systems are integrated with cameras. So it sees that it picked it up, so that's why you can't really have this hand out there in the world unless it has like an eye attached to it or something. So it's still getting there, but it works pretty well. I think you had a question. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, in your research you come across the Osmo 
robot developed by Honda uh, about 15 years ago. It can, it, what made me think of it is uh, it climbs stairs, it dances. Ah. Um, very flexible. I'm surprised that, that yeah. I mean, I've seen it do its thing, like I've seen it do, but I don't necessarily know the technology behind it. Yeah, I, I don't know, do you? Uh, I'm a, a little familiar with it. I've seen it do it things. It can, it can do things like climb stairs, but it would still run into the same problems that Lisa mentioned about uh, something like the, uh, the Atlas robot, that if you change the stairs a lot or you, yeah. you know, a kid dropped his heavy bear on the stairs, it might have a hard time adapting to changes in that. Very structured in its program. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot is, it can, some of them can do, was it the Atlas that did backflips? Yeah. yeah, so it can do really fancy things, but it's really good at doing that, but if you did, try to do a backflip on the moon, probably it's not going to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah? Um, as far as the, uh, the soft robotics and the vacuum control, are you finding um, uh, is it advancing where uh, you can have the accurate enough control with the level of vacuum that you can really do intricate changes with, in the stiffness? With really good vacuums, yes, but most of those are big and loud. So vacuum pump technology needs to get much better for this technology to like put in your pocket and have, like we proved that this would be good as a wrist brace. So we put one of these structures on a human. We showed that when it's not connected to vacuum, you have same range of motion you would as if you had no brace on. And then we connected to a vacuum and we made them carry a load and we saw that their muscles was, were doing nothing. So we proved that, but of course we had a vacuum line, a pump that was like okay. next to it, so. Okay, so it's all purely at almost theoretical level at this point. In terms of practice, like I mean you could have these structures if you have the, a good seal. So one of the students that's working with me, an undergraduate student, try to make splints out of these things. So if you're out in the field, there's an open wound, you put it around the person, you vacuum it, and then you just seal it, then it can be there, and then you can go back and unseal it, make it stiff, like make it soft again. So things like that, yes, but to be like on the drone and to be able to control it at that point when it's flying, that's right now not there yet. But the solution would, of that would be, if I don't want to dedicate my PhD to making better vacuum pumps and more play around with these kinds of things, then I could use some sort of mechanical device. So something like, I don't know if you've seen Chinese finger traps, like when you pull them and they squeeze. So if I have things like that that can mechanically squeeze or have a linkage system that just squeezes them together. I would imagine you uh, tried to reverse that engineering and work with pressure instead of vacuum. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And pressure could possibly be done in canister form or something like that yeah. as a reserve as opposed to a motor creating vacuum. You can carry a vacuum reserve too in the same way. You just like put, you just vacuum the inside of a vessel and then you can connect it direct. So it's the same thing, but vacuum is more difficult. So we, we have somebody here that works with uh, inflatable things too. I work with deflatable things. Inflatable things is sometimes easier because you won't realize leaks. But if this thing has a tiny leak in it, just one air bubble, it's just not gonna work. So it's a little fussy and sometimes annoying. But one thing we did with pressure, theoretically, is that if you had clamps around it, and then if you pressurized it, then you could open the clamps, and then it would be flexible. So it would be the reverse version of this. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Yes? How do you find your art background coming up in this project? It's very crafty. <laughs> I have to like sit there, do a lot of detailed things, and it's very... Um, it's a lot about three-dimensional thinking. So I showed you about layer jamming, but right now my research is developing to layers, fibers, and grains. So I'm thinking, how can you combine all these geometries and jam them? I just want to jam everything I see. And <laughs> so that is like very three-dimensional thinking, a lot of playing around. So I think in that sense, because my background is in sculpture, so I think that helps a lot in terms of just trying to be creative, because a lot of this is, um, I mean, some people do the design first, but I just like put together something makeshift and then see what it does, and then I go back and I'm like, so okay, how did this actually work? So for me, that's how it kind of functions. No more questions? Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, most of the examples you are giving are more like a mechanical, uh, but I remember seeing uh, sometime ago a video when 
was a muscle kind of structure, like a, mm -hmm. and you were able to put like a liquid, I don't remember what's liquid, and then the structure like muscle was able to expand or retract, like a, like a making, like a deflection of, of, um, of, of, of an arm, for example. So I was wondering, is there not some research in that side, like a more like a chemical that you can put in some, hmm. in some, st um, not tissue-like, and then they is going to make it to expand or retract. Chemically, there there are things like shape memory alloys, which is the example I gave in terms of temperature. So there's things that change the way the particles are with related related to each other. If you heat it up, it goes to one shape. And if you cool it down, it goes to another shape. So there's things like that chemically. But what you said about muscle-like, those are the very mechanical versions of those. So if you c imagine just like this intertwined weave of things like on a bag, but if you design the weaves really well, if you like, if you pull them, sometimes it squishes, or if you pull it out, it, it sort of contracts. So there are little, we call them actuators, but like little muscle-like things that we've been using in robots too. So that would still count as a soft robot because you're using air or liquid inside it, but that's mechanical. So there are chemical versions. I know of them, but I wouldn't be able to explain in detail how the science works. But why we chose not to work with them is because you need temperature, you need voltage, you need magnets. And if I'm looking at wearables, I don't want those things around a human. So mechanical things, vacuum is a bit more sort of human safe, as that's why we really didn't choose that path when we're doing variable stiffness structures. I don't know if that answered your question. Are we good? Great. Let's give both our speakers a nice round of applause.